that you would bless us richly. In Jesus' name, amen. In Proverbs 10.22, it says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. What makes one rich? It is the blessing of the Lord. And he adds no what? Sorrow with it. Yes. You know what? They gave you the wrong one. Yeah, they gave you, oh, you know what? Hang on to that. Bring that tomorrow morning. They gave you the wrong one. Tonight, we don't have a handout. We have a study guide that they're going to give to you. Um, they were supposed to give you a study guide that you take home with you. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get the study guide? Okay. Well, they give it to you on the way out then. Presentation tonight? It should be number 12, I believe. But, but there's no study guide. Yeah. No study guide that you fill out tonight. Okay. I want to tell you about a girl who was in need of a blessing, a big blessing. And do you know what her name happened to be? Her name happened to be Blessing. I met, her in I met her in China a few years ago. What Blessing desperately needed was a blessing. The subject of her email was plea for spiritual guidance. Hello, Pastor. I hope you, I find you well. I was at the recent camp we had in Zhenjiang. I would like to ask you with regards to trusting God and obedience based on the motive behind the disobedience. Do you understand what she, where she's going with this? Is it okay to disobey if, you, if your motives are good? Like in China, working on Sabbath because you know your parents can't afford to pay your school fees and you want to help them. Is that a good deed? Trying to help your parents? So, does that make it okay? No. If not, how can I implement obedience in such circumstances? I know God can provide, but my sister is in the same situation. She works for her school fees, and when I came to China, I had to depend on her. Does she really believe that God can provide? Yeah. Let me tell you a story. So there was this famous tightrope walker. His name was Charles Blondin. And he used to walk across this tightrope across the Niagara Falls. And he was good. I mean, he could go forward and backwards. He could go blindfolded. One day he shows up with a wheelbarrow with a sack of potatoes in it. He's pushing it back and forth. And the people would come out to watch him. And they just loved Charles Blondin. He was just the best. And they would, they would, they would applaud. And, and he would just get them so excited. Well, one day, he looks over at the people, he's got his wheelbarrow, and he says, do you believe I could push people across, I could push someone with, with someone in the wheelbarrow across? And what do you think they said? Of course. You're simply the greatest. So what do you think he asked for? A volunteer. I need a volunteer. How many hands do you think went up? None. What, you don't think he was that great? It's one thing to believe. It's another thing to trust. Faith is trusting God. Okay. The Bible says even the demons believe and tremble. The demons believe what the Word of God says. The question is, do you trust God? Do you think she really believed that God can provide? No. Nope, doesn't seem like it. I felt it was selfish of me to refuse a job that works on the Sabbath, yet expect my sister, who is younger than me, to take care of me when she went with the money she gets. Blessing wants to be a blessing to her parents and to her sister. Since her motives are good, would it be okay to work on the Sabbath and work on the Sabbath since her motives are incredibly good and noble? Just a reminder, in the future, the issue of loyalty will center around what? Worship. Worship. What do you think Blessing wanted to hear from me? Of course it's okay. Of course.
course it's okay. God understands. In your situation, God understands because your motives are good. Because if I would tell her that, then she could go back doing that and she would feel less guilty. What do you think I told her? So I sent her a reply. I said, hello, blessing. Thank you for your question. In Acts 17, verse 30, does anybody know what it says in Acts 17, 30? Put it up on the screen. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. Isn't God merciful? When people do things in ignorance, he overlooks. Or as one translation puts it, he winks. But now, when they know better, when they know the truth, commands all men everywhere to repent. And I wrote, I want to encourage you to, to seek to put God first. If you do, you can trust that God will provide as he has promised in Matthew 6.33. What does it say in Matthew 6.33? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Do you believe this promise? There's a man who took care of over 10,000 orphans during his lifetime in England who claimed this promise and only went to God for all of his needs. Do you know what his name is? George Mueller. George Mueller. God is faithful. By the way, he lived in the day and age where no one prayed. They, they believed that God was out there, but that God didn't intervene in the affairs of man. And, and, and the reason he ran this ministry by faith is because he wanted the world to know, hey, there's a God who hears and answers prayers. So I shared this promise with blessing, and then I shared with her this, this uh, promise from a book called Desire of Ages. And the author of Desire of Ages is Ellen White. Many of you got a book a couple nights ago titled Steps to Christ by the same author. She writes, he bids them seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and his promise is that all things needful to them for this life shall be added. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future, but Jesus sees the end from the beginning. beginning. In every difficulty, he has his way prepared to bring relief. Anybody here facing a difficult situation? Okay, me too. I'm in a situation where I need God to intervene and work a miracle because there's no way I'm getting out of it unless God intervenes. So I understand. I want you to understand that God has his way prepared to bring relief. If you can trust him and keep your eyes fixed on him instead of on the promise, on the problem, that is, you will see God provide. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which you know nothing. How many ways? A thousand. Okay. So if you and I could come up with a list of maybe 500 ways that God could provide for us. He could provide for us through the bank. He could provide through us through a family member. If we could come up with a list of 500 ways as a group, collectively, how many ways does God still have? No, 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 no. No. God still has how many? He still has a thousand. Because it's a thousand ways of which we know nothing. Are you with me? Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish in a plain path before their feet. I ended the email with these words. Right now, it may look to you like there's no other way to provide for school fees if you do not work on the Sabbath. But the truth is, God has a thousand ways of which you know nothing. I want to encourage you to pay tithe faithfully and honor God by keeping the Ten Commandments. And you will see God open the windows of heaven. And what do you think God did for her? God rained a huge blessing down on blessing and fulfilled his promise. Would you like to hear her testimony? Yeah. All right. I wish to share my story that turned into a what? Testimony. testimony with someone who feels like they have no choice but to work on Sabbath in order to make ends meet. Anybody here, you feel like you're just kind of stuck and you have to work on the Sabbath to make ends meet? This is for you. Maybe you will be encouraged to step out of that situation in obedience to God, knowing that the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Now, I'm not going to share the whole entire testimony because it's too long, but I'm going to share with you the juicy parts. All right? 
I landed myself into a situation of outright disobedience. To the fourth commandment, as a Seventh-day Adventist, I knew better. As a Seventh-day Adventist, I very well knew, know that the seventh, Sabbath is the day of the Lord, but when I moved to China, I found myself caught in the web of working on Saturday, which is a normal working day in China, the Sabbath day. Coming from a middle-class family, I felt the need to help my parents in paying for my tuition. I ended up getting a job that did not exempt me from working on Saturdays, where I worked for eight sad and long months. Can you imagine this college student? For eight long months, not sleeping on a soft pillow. What do I mean? Have you heard of the proverb, a clear conscience makes a soft pillow? You will sleep better if you have no feelings of guilt or remorse. Sad because every Sabbath I would feel the gravity of my disobedience to God. It would become very real every Saturday when I had to spend a full day working, yet as a Seventh-day Adventist, I knew better than to do so. Was she under conviction? Yeah. Yes. My defense for taking up this job was that God would excuse me for taking it up in the first place. I told myself I had no choice and was doing it for a noble cause, and surely God would excuse my disobedience based on my good intentions. She believed the devil's lie. What's the devil's lie? Yeah, your intentions are good. So therefore, you're excused. God will excuse you because your motives are good. However, this did not lessen the guilt and sadness I felt each time I would be working on Sabbath. I kept feeling the need to break away from the cycle, but the cares of this world and the cause for which I was working on the Sabbath kept on reminding me of how real the circumstances would be if I quit this job, hence I held onto it longer. It was the devil who kept on reminding her of how real the circumstances would be if she quit the job. One day, I decided to write a pastor in the church asking for advice on how to escape my situation. But honestly, a part of me just wanted the pastor's what? Validation. Validation and approval of my noble cause for working on Saturday in disobedience to God's commandment. Now, what would happen if I told her, it's okay, God understands. It's okay to disobey God's commandments. Who would God hold accountable on Judgment Day? You. It would be me, right? I expected the pastor to understand my situation just as I thought God would understand. Yeah, God, God, God understands, right? He's a nice guy, right? Friends, God is very particular. Amen? Amen? I explained to him my situation and, of course, included all of my bad reasons for continuing to do so. Contrary to my defensive stance, the pastor did not commend my good motives for disobeying God. With such encouraging words ever before me, I decided to fast, asking God to give me strength to quit this job and he did. If you're struggling, pray. And if you're not getting answers, pray and fast. Pray and fast. Fasting always accomplishes something, says Ian e. Bounds, an individual who has written volumes on the subject of prayer. Quitting this job, I had no prospect of getting a new one, and I started using the little money I had tried to save up for school fees for my daily upkeep. The situation did look hopeless in my carnal eyes, but little did I know that while I was still worrying about my diminishing savings, God had already provided for my school fees with a 100% scholarship from my university. Only 11 students managed to get full scholarships at my school, and God made my name to be among those 11 people. Amazing? Did she deserve it? No. No. She didn't deserve it. For eight months, she was disobedient. But what a wonderful God we serve. Amen? Amen? Yes. A God of grace. A God of mercy and love. He did provide, so here I am today, testifying that there is never a time when God cannot be trusted. And now God is using her testimony to encourage me. Because I've got a neighbor who wants over $500,000 from me because of the fire that started on our property and went over and did a lot of damage on their property. All I can do is look to him and put my trust in him, 
knowing that God has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. So I encourage you to step out in obedient faith, not letting worry magnify the impossibilities in your situation. I thank God that he rescued me from this cycle of disobedience to the Sabbath commandment and gave me a testimony. He can do it for you too. Only trust and obey. God bless. How does that hymn go? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Is this an amazing testimony? Yes. Do you know why she has this beautiful testimony today? It's because she passed a test. She passed the what? She passed the test. Without a test, there is no testimony. Now, every one of us should have a testimony. Is that correct? Yes. In Revelation uh, chapter 12, verse 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and did not love their lives to the death. Every follower of Christ should have a testimony. And the reason we have a testimony is because we've passed a test. For some of us, it was a small test. For others, it was a huge test. God says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, For those who honor me, I will honor. I will honor. Proverbs 10, 22, we'll read it again. It says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Would you like to hear a more incredible testimony? Now, this next testimony is more incredible. Do you know why it's more incredible? <laughs> No, I wish it happened to me. I wish this was my testimony. It's more incredible because the person passed a greater what? Test. Greater test. A much greater test. Much more was on the line. You ready for this story? Several years ago, my wife and I made a trip to Guam, and we spent a day at the Alupong Beach Club, and we enjoyed many activities. This is from their website. You can enjoy snorkeling, jet skiing, dolphin watching, parasailing, and many other activities. And what made it extra nice for my wife and I is that we didn't have to pay a dime. Do you know why? Because we snuck in. No, 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 no. No, because we knew the owner. We knew the owner. Let me tell you a story. Steve Kasperbauer was attending a series of meetings just like the one we've had here. And one night, he learned about the fourth commandment. And when he met the speaker, he says, if I follow what you say, I might as well shut down my business and declare bankruptcy. Declare what? Bankruptcy. bankruptcy. The speaker asked him to elaborate. It turned out that his business was tourism. Business was what? Tourism. Can you see the problem? Because when your business is in tourism, what's your busiest day? Saturday. He had 13 contracts with hotels on beachfront for which he provided all the sports equipment. The greatest amount of business was usually on the Sabbath. He also informed the speaker that a typhoon had, had, had just destroyed a third of his equipment for which there was no insurance. He also explained that he had a hundred workers and felt responsible for them and their families. How many workers? hundred. This is big business. The speaker wanted to test the level of his conviction. He asked, what is more important to you, your salvation or your business? What do you think he said? My salvation. The speaker was pleased to hear him say, my salvation. The pastor encouraged him to follow the conviction the Lord had placed on his heart. Steve decided to surrender his life to Christ and keep the Sabbath. Two years later, Steve called the speaker. Got a minute? Steve asked. He then began to unfold a wonderful miracle. After surrendering his life to the Lord, Steve decided to terminate the 13 contracts. Can you say amen? He talked and explained his newfound convictions to his employees, and their response was, Amen. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it's you're crazy. You're crazy. They felt he was putting their lives on the line for a stupid religious idea. Well, Steve stuck with his conviction. Can you say amen? 
He closed his main shop on Saturday. His employees thought that he would lose his business to his competitors, but it was not to be. For seven months, guess what happened? Huh? For seven months, every Sabbath, it rained like cats and dogs. And every Sunday, the sun came out and it was just beautiful every Sunday. And his business increased over the next seven months. He said that prior to keeping the Sabbath, he could never keep up with his debts. But once he kept the Sabbath, he was able to pay off $3 million of his debt. He was now far better off financially than ever before. How could God do this? Because he is our creator. Because he is Lord of heaven and earth. He is Lord of sea and sky. And God says, I will honor them that honor me. Boy, does that inspire you to want to honor God as your creator and redeemer. Amen? Amen. For those who honor me, I will honor. God has promised to bless us if we will honor him as creator and redeemer. And how do we do that? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So the Bible calls us to recognize God as creator and redeemer by keeping holy the Sabbath day. Now, how does God call us to recognize and honor him as our provider, sustainer, and owner of all things? How do you do this? We do this through a practice called tithes and offerings. Tithing is first mentioned in the book of Genesis. Turn with me to Genesis 28, verse 30. Genesis 28, verse 30. Jacob is fleeing for his life from his vengeful brother Esau, and he makes a deal with God, and God takes him up on it. Verse 20, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and the stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Give how much? A tenth. Jacob is saying, God, if you will do all that I need you to do, feed me and clothe me and bring me back home in peace, then I will give you one-tenth of all that I give to you. Now turn with me to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi picks up this theme and turns it into a dynamite promise from God himself. Bring to me all the tithes and watch what I will do. Verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. In what? In tithes and offerings. Now, what is the purpose of tithes and offerings? It is to further the work of the gospel. It makes it possible for ministers to continue to preach the gospel. If you're not going to be called into the ministry full-time to preach the gospel, then you need to give a little portion of what God blesses you with so that Others can do it. Amen? Amen? The messages that we have been sharing in this prophecy seminar, these messages need to go out to the world so that Jesus can come back soon. Amen? Verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, and now try me now in this. The KJV says, prove me now. In other words, test me. Do what? Test me. Friends, this is the one place in Scripture where God says, test me. Try me now in this. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Isn't that beautiful? How many of you would like to see God open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing? Amen. Now, many of you may be saying, what is a type? It's an interesting word. You don't hear it unless you're at church. It's a biblical word. A tithe is one-tenth of your income. That's what the word tithe means, one-tenth. So in other words, let's say that you make $1,000 a week. How many of you make $1,000 a week? All right, let's say you make $100 a week. Okay, how much would a tithe be? Ten bucks. Ten bucks. All right. Now here's the good news. You get to keep 
90 of it. Okay. God could have said, hey, you give me 90 of it and you keep 10. But God says, you give me 10. 10. And you keep the other 90. That's good news, amen? And God takes that one tenth and uses it to, f- to further the gospel. An offering, for those of you who may not know, an offering is whatever the Holy Spirit lays upon your heart to give. The, t- the tithe primarily goes to pay the salary of God's full-time workers and makes it possible for the gospel to go around the world. Okay? So the tithe is used to uh, support the full-time workers and makes it possible for the gospel to go around the world. What is the offering used for? The offering stays in the church and helps keep the lights on. It uh, helps keep the church looking nice and clean, pays for the utilities, and makes it possible for us to have meetings like this in the local church. Does that make sense? Now, here are some principles to keep in mind when giving offerings. He who sows sparingly will also what? Reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a what? God loves a cheerful giver. That's right. In Haggai 2.8, it says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. So the money in our wallets, the money in our purses, and the money in our bank accounts, who does it really belong to? God. We're just called to be stewards. Called to be what? Stewards. And God's testing us to see whether we will be faithful and wise stewards. Psalms 50 verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Is that a lot of cattle? It's not a thousand cattle on a hill. It's the cattle on how many hills? On a thousand hills. Recently, I was on a, I was on a, a conversation, a, a number of us who, who, who do this kind of work, um, we get together to pray once a week, and a friend of mine, he travels back and forth across the country, hauling a fifth wheel. Now, you know how challenging that can be with the gas prices going up? So, so I, said, I said, how do you plan on doing that, keeping that up, with the gas prices going up? And you know what he says? He said, he said well, my God owns all the gas stations, <laughs> okay, <laughs> on every curb. <laughs> my God will take care of me. Amen? Amen? God is the owner of all things, amen? amen? And provider and sustainer. Psalms 50, verse 11, I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. Friends, God owns it all. The money in our bank account, our possessions, it really all belongs to God. God tests us with our time and with our money. God asks us to give him one-seventh of our time each week. When we come together to worship God on the seventh-day Sabbath, we are honoring God as creator and redeemer. God asks us to give him a seventh of our time, and he asks us to give him a tenth of our earnings. When we faithfully return tithe, by the way, I didn't say give tithe, I said return tithe. What are we doing? We are honoring God as owner, sustainer, and provider of all. Now, God has all the time in the world. Does he really need our time? No. No. What does he really want? He wants our hearts. And in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 6, verse 21, it says, for where your treasures are, that's where your heart is. God wants our hearts. Does God need our nickels and dimes? No. No. He owns it all. He wants our hearts. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
I want to share with you a testimony that is absolutely inspiring. Her name is, her name is Brooks. Hi, my name is Brooke, and I want to share my story with you. In 2012, I was sick, physically and spiritually. I was also in constant, at times, debilitating pain. I spent most of that year searching for answers, finding none. I can't begin to count the number of doctor visits, tests, nights I cried myself to sleep desperate for something to change. Dr. Bill started piling up and I sank deeper. God's promises just didn't seem to ring true for me. I believed Satan's lies that I just didn't deserve to be blessed by God, that this is just what life was for me. Uh, towards the end of that year, Pastor Allen announced his tithing challenge. He said if we weren't blessed by giving to God first from what He gives us. But they would give our money back. I had been giving to the church, but only what I thought I could afford with all the bills I had to pay. But I decided to take that challenge knowing in my heart that it's God's will for us to tithe. It was difficult at first, but I trusted God. So the first week of January, my boss calls and says, I'm getting a raise. I knew in that moment that God was at work. So I increased my tithe and my joy increased. Two weeks later, a doctor finally figures out what's making me sick. And my health turns around in a week and my joy increased. A couple months after that, I started seeing a counselor to start healing the spiritual brokenness, and my joy increased. I became a member of this church in May, and again, my joy increased. In August, I had a life-changing back surgery. Now I'm pain-free, and my joy has increased. While I was at home recovering from surgery, I get a call out of nowhere. Someone is moving to Corbin and they want to know if I'm interested in renting out my home. So I said yes. So again, with the extra income, I increased my tithe and my joy again increased. My relationships are improving. My bills are paid. I feel like a new and improved version of myself. In Malachi 3, verse 10, God tells us, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, and see if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Trust Him with your life, your relationships, your finances, your health, all of it. God is always, always faithful to His Word. Amen. God is faithful. Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse and now try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. What an amazing promise. Friends, we serve a wonderful God who wants to bless us, and he will if we will honor him as creator, redeemer, owner, sustainer, and provider of all and for all. Is that your desire to honor him? Please raise your hand. Amen. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you and we thank you for you are the giver of every good gift and every perfect gift. Father, you are our creator, our redeemer, our maker, helper, and friend, and so much more. I just pray, Lord, that you would bless us, help us, Lord, every day of our lives to put you first, to seek first your kingdom, to trust your word, and to follow after you. Thank you so much, Lord, for guiding us. Continue to guide our steps. Take us higher and further in our walk with you. Pray these things in Jesus' name.
We hope you join us tomorrow morning at, uh, at 9.45. My, mo- my wife is sharing her testimony. And then at 11, we have Revelation Scarlet Harlot. Um, for those of you, um, unless you have your folder and you've put that study guide in your folder, you might just want to drop it off on the table and we'll give it to you again tomorrow, only because if you all take them home, we might be short on them tomorrow morning. So, and we'll have another study guide for you to take home tonight.